Good morning. My name's Luke Harding. I'm a journalist on The Guardian and a, a writer, and I've been involved in this kind of incredible story um, of Edward Snowden, wh whom you saw very briefly there before he was kind of zapped <laughs> remotely by someone or other. Um, and uh, it, it's an incredible story. I'm sure you're familiar with um, <clears throat> much of it up to a point. It's a story of surveillance, of spying, of international relations. Um, but it's also a, a story about law and, and indeed lawyers uh, who, who really have kind of, kind of played a pretty heroic part in all of this, uh, both at my newspaper uh, and across the world in many jurisdictions. Um, and actually, I think without lawyers, this, this leak, this incredible Snowden leak would never have happened. If I can take you back to 2012, we had a young man called Edward Snowden who was a 29-year-old contractor with the National Security Agency, America's most sort of super secret spy agency, who had become, I would say, <clears throat> progressively disillusioned with American spying, American surveillance uh, in the years after 9-11, and who felt that the kind of US surveillance state had turned into a monster and had stopped spying on, on legitimate targets, on terrorists, on Al-Qaeda, on the Russian leadership and had started spying uh, instead on, on you guys, on ordinary citizens, uh, both in the US and globally. Um, and so he came up with a plan, and, and this is the lawyer bit. He decided he would leak classified uh, top secret, above top secret material to a group of journalists. And the journalist he landed on um, was Glenn Greenwald, um, who was a colleague of mine at The Guardian's uh, last year, um, and who was a former lawyer who'd spent a decade litigating uh, in federal courts and state courts in the United States, and then in 2005 had resigned from the legal profession um, and become a blogger. He kind of found his voice in the George Bush era and had written on, on uh, civil rights, on abuses, on surveillance. And so Snowden, sitting in Hawaii, decided that he would reach out to Glenn Greenwald, who lives in, in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and try and get in touch with him. This is all in uh, 2012. And um, what, what's kind of fascinating about this is that uh, it, it very nearly didn't work. So um, Edward Snowden was absolutely kind of familiar with what the NSA could do, and he was very, very cautious. So he sent an email to Glenn Greenwald uh, in Rio de Janeiro, simply saying, like something out of a kind of spy novel, I am a senior member of the American intelligence community, I may have something of interest for you. Um, and I've been to see Glenn in Rio de Janeiro, and he's one of those people who is, you might say, kind of perpetually distracted. He has, he has his laptop open all the time. He has 16 chat windows open. Uh, he and his partner, David Miranda, have also adopted 10 stray dogs. So there's a dog jumping on his head. Uh, there's the phone ringing. It's this kind of tropical chaos, basically, in Brazil. Um, and so Glenn got this email from Slo Snowden, but he didn't really do anything with it. He sort of pinged off a reply. Um, and for Snowden, this must have been extremely frustrating because he, he was taking enormous risks in trying to leak this material. Um, and so a couple of weeks later, he tried again. He made... Uh, an encryption video showing Glenn how to download encryption software so the two could have a kind of proper conversation. Um, and I, I kind of reviewed this video um, a, a while ago, actually after I'd written my book, and it, it's a very funny document because Snowden sounds, I don't know if you have Doctor Who in Norway, but he sounds like a Dalek. He's disguised his voice, so it's Snowden plus Dalek, kind of like this, but explaining. And then he basically tells Glenn that he needs to come up with a password uh, not one, two, three, four, anything like that. It has to be a long, complicated password to deal with encryption. And Snowden's suggestion, something that the spies will not necessarily guess, Snowden's suggestion is Margaret Thatcher is 100% sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Thatcher is 100% sexy. Now, I, I remember the 1980s, but I, I, I don't remember that. <laughs> but anyway, so... So this, this, was, this was the idea. And so Glenn kind of looks, glancing at the video, but dogs jumping on his head, phone going, chat windows open, 400 emails a day. He doesn't, he doesn't do it. <clears throat> and so you can only imagine Snowden's frustration <clears throat> sitting in Hawaii trying to, trying to kind of get this process up, up and running, knowing that email is completely compromised. So he then tries a different tack, which is um, in... <clears throat> 
January of last year, um, 2013, he decides to approach someone called Laura Poitras, who uh, is an American documentary maker, a very brave woman who'd made a couple of documentaries on, on the war in Iraq, and who'd been perpetually harassed by the US authorities whenever she entered the continental United States because of the subject matter, because she was doing stuff on surveillance and so on, and had relocated to Berlin. Now, unlike Glenn, um, Laura was very good at encryption, and she got a similar email from Snowden sitting in Hawaii saying, I've got, I've got some interesting information for you, let's, let's, let's talk. And they, had, they began a, a sort of furtive encrypted correspondence between Berlin and Hawaii which went through the spring of last year. Um, and initially, Laura was very kind of paranoid. She thought this was some kind of CIA trap. But, but gradually, a kind of relationship of trust developed. Um, and Snowden then pinged her a few documents, which he said, uh, he asserted, lifted the lid on massive secret civilian surveillance by the United States and its allies, including, including the United Kingdom. Um, and she realized this was, this was an enormous story. Um, asked Snowden if she might meet him uh, and interview him. Um, but at this point, she didn't know who he was. She didn't know what his real name was. He was acting under a, a pseudonym. He called himself Citizen Four. Citizen Four, which is the name of Laura Poitras' documentary, which has just come out uh, last month, and which I, I recommend you to watch um, if you can. Um, and so this, this gradual dance continued. Um, and Things fast forwarded about April, May of last year when uh, Laura talked to Glenn um, and Glenn, who was working for The Guardian, talked to, to my editors in New York and London. Um, and we, we realized that this potentially was, was the, the biggest story, I think, of our careers, bearing in mind we'd done WikiLeaks, the Julian Assange disclosures, leaked diplomatic cables. I'd worked on that story three years before. Um, and so... May of last year, um, Janine Gibson, who was the editor-in-chief of Guardian US, um, basically decides to add another person to the, the, the sort of core people who are doing this story, um, who's a wonderful colleague of mine called Ewan McCaskill, um, who is a former Washington correspondent, but he, he's, he's Glaswegian, and I, I don't know, Star Trek, do you remember Star Trek? He sounds like Scotty from Star Trek. So he says, I, rather than yes. Um, and so... Essentially, what happened was that they knew they were going to interview the source. It was the source at this stage, but they didn't know who the source was. Um, and Snowden sent another encrypted email to Laura Poitras saying, your destination is Hong Kong. By the way, my name is Edward Snowden. Now, normally in that situation, if, if, if it's you, you're going to meet someone for the first time, that you, you Google them, you, you look at their Facebook profile, you see who their friends are. And of course, in this case, that immediately would have potentially alerted the NSA um, and said none of that happened. Um, instead, the three of them got on, got on a Cathay Pacific flight to Hong Kong um, where they went to go and meet their source. And I, I, I've talked to Glenn and Laura about this when I was researching for my book, and it's an extraordinary story that bears repeating. Snowden had come up with these elaborate protocols um, for how they would meet, how they, they would identify themselves. He was staying in the Mirror Hotel in Hong Kong. I, I was just there two weeks ago. It's a hotel in Kowloon, right in the center of Hong Kong. Um, and he said that he would meet them near the hotel in a kind of quiet shopping center right next door, next to a large plastic alligator. Um, and he would be holding a Rubik's Cube. Now, if, if I'd said to my literary agent, a couple of years ago. I've got this great story, it involves a spy, he's defecting, he goes to Hong Kong, oh, he has a Rubik's Cube, there's an alligator. I think, you know, she would have said, actually, have another go. <laughs> that's, that's never gonna happen, but that's precisely what happened. But Glenn told me that he was expecting, essentially, uh, he didn't know why Hong Kong. This was completely mystifying to them. Um, he was expecting a kind of grizzled, born conspiracy, CIA, operative um, in his sort of 60s with gray hair, gold glasses, blazer, dandruff, you know, club tie, this kind of thing. And instead, they get to the crocodile, and, and there appears a sort of young, terribly thin sort of student type um, with, with a bit of a beard, who, who, who Glenn told me looked barely old enough to shave. Um, and there was this moment of cognitive dissonance where they just thought, Oh, no, this is all a hoax. We've been hoaxed. It's not real. Um, but, of course, it was real. Then they went upstairs with 
um, uh, Snowden to his hotel room. And, and um, they sat down, Laura started filming, and Glenn started talking. And wh what's interesting, if you look at the film, is that Glenn, when meeting Snowden for the first time, he kind of reverted to, to lawyer mode. He went into kind of professional litigator mode and started bombarding Snowden with kind of hostile questions to establish the veracity of who he was, of what he was saying, and so on. And it was, it's real kind of, real and kind of interrogation stuff. Um, and at the end of the first day, they were pretty convinced that, that Snowden was genuine, that he was the real deal. Uh, and at this point, Ewan McCaskill, my, my wonderful Scottish uh, colleague, uh, also met Snowden for the first time and started, he took a different approach. So Glenn's approach was loyally, uh, and Ewan's approach was reporterly. In other words, he asked for documentation, for um, ID, for passport, and so on. And uh, some things about Snowden's CV were a little curious. I mean, for example, he'd, he'd, he'd volunteered to fight in Iraq, uh, which was odd because, I mean, he, he was deeply myopic, very short-sighted. He was no soldier uh, at all. Um, he didn't have a university degree. He was a high school dropout, and yet he was offering tens of thousands of top-secret documents. I mean, this didn't kind of quite match up. But um, after a while, Ewan became convinced that Snowden was indeed a genuine whistleblower. Uh, a genuine National Security Agency employee. Um, and <clears throat> we journalists who've been involved in the story, we, <clears throat> we also kind of did the sort of spycraft stuff. We were never very good at it. Um, the, the real spies were much better than we are, but we kind of tried our best. And Ewan had been told that if Snowden were genuine, he had to send a text back to New York. Um, and there were two possibilities. Genuine, the Guinness is good. Fal false, fake, the Guinness is bad. Uh, Ewan was a big fan of Guinness. He would drink Guinness a lot in the pub whenever we met. And so uh, after three hours with Snowden, he, he types out, the Guinness is good. And this flicks the switch on what I think, in my view, was the most significant leak of national security information that we've ever had. I think it eclipses the Pentagon Papers. I think it goes further than WikiLeaks. And I think it really transforms um, the way we think about the world, the way we think about the digital world. Um, but what's interesting is that um, our decision to publish these stories last summer immediately brought us uh, a whole heap of trouble. We were suddenly in conflict with some very powerful people and some very powerful governments, the American government, the British government, uh, other members of this kind of Anglophone spying club, which is called Five Eyes. It doesn't include Norway, but it's, it's, it's the US, the UK, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. Um, and we, we had a series of editorial challenges, we had logistical challenges because we couldn't talk to each other on the phone because all the phones were compromised, and we had legal problems. So one of the things that my editor did, Alan Rusbridger, was to send the uh, Guardian's in-house head of legal to Hong Kong during this period to kind of mull over questions like, what would happen to our journalists if they were caught with this top secret material? What um, how could we negotiate all of that? Meanwhile, um, we also found lawyers for Edward Snowden who spirited him away. So he, he after the first few stories, he kind of um, disappeared and the lawyers found him a kind of safe hiding spot, which uh, again was a kind of fantastic thing for them to do. Um, so during that kind of giddy week in Hong Kong, we, we started publishing. We published a story about uh, Verizon, which showed that uh, the National Security Agency was secretly hoovering up the phone records of every American. This is on a kind of rolling uh, warrant from a secret court, the FISA court. They were taking everyone's phone data. Then we did another story about the prison program, which revealed that the uh, NSA um, had direct access to the kind of digital platforms that we use all the time, to Facebook, to, to Yahoo, to, to Google, and so on, um, and was seemingly kind of collaborating with them. Um, and, then we, and, that, and then another astonishing thing happened, which was that Snowden had made, all, made it clear all along that he intended to, um, to go public, to actually own up to these leaks. And so Laura filmed the video, which I'm sure many of you have seen. In fact, we saw 10 seconds of it at the beginning, where Snowden talks about why he's done what, what, what he did. Um, and I was part of the team uh, in London who, who looked at some of the material that Snowden gave us. He gave us tens of thousands of secret documents from, from GCHQ, about 60,000 in total, which showed that the British were not only heavily involved in, in surveillance and spying, 
but also, in some respects, according to Snowden, were worse than the National Security Agency. Um, and we began publishing these, and this immediately brought us into conflict with the British government led by David Cameron, um, of whom I have to say, between friends, I, I am not a big fan. Um, <laughs> um, now, I, I don't, for those of you not <clears throat> sort of familiar with, with, with British kind of class culture and hierarchy, uh, David Cameron is, is, is an old Etonian from, from Britain's most exclusive private school and surrounds himself in cabinet with like-minded uh, Etonian privately educated millionaires who are very used to getting their own way and kind of revert to bullying when things go wrong. And that's precisely what happened uh, with us, that we, we began publishing stories uh, in The Guardian in London. Uh, I was in a secret bunker on the fourth floor. Um, our offices are in King's Cross. We're just across the road from King's Cross Station, you know, where Harry Potter lives, or at least where Harry Potter takes the train to <laughs> Hogwarts from platform nine and three quarters. In fact, on my way to work, I see the Japanese, there's a fake nine and three quarters now. I see the Japanese cure, tourists queuing up every morning to have their photo taken with a Harry Potter lookalike. But, so we could almost see that from the secret bunker. Um, and, th and there we interrogated these documents, many of which were baffling, incomprehensible at first, written in a kind of machine language. Um, but we took every reasonable security precaution. We worked on four laptops which had never been connected to the internet and were, were offline. We had security guards 24 hours a day outside the, the door where we were working. We had a, a very small team of trusted people who were allowed access to this material. We had plenty of legal advice. Um, and we had a kind of a note pinned on the wall about what we were doing, which said essentially that we were not going on a fishing expedition. We were looking for stories of high public importance, which lifted the lid on mass surveillance of civilian populations. Um, and I think we handled this material responsibly. But the British government um, initially were, um, they, they were in a daze. They didn't know what, what the hell was going on. They, were, they couldn't really get their hands around this league court. They didn't know who Edward Snowden was and so on. But after a while, they they gradually uh, came to themselves, and David Cameron um, turned to his cabinet secretary. He, this is the most senior unelected official uh, in Britain, the, the cabinet secretary, senior civil servant, someone called Sir Jeremy Hayward. Uh, and so David Cameron, I think, one morning, pointed to Sir Jeremy and said, you know, Sir Jeremy, deal with these rotters of the Guardian, deal with them. Um, and so Sir Jeremy came around um, and basically said that they were deeply unhappy about this um, and they wanted this material back, this Snowden material back. Um, and he began this slightly surreal conversation by saying, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Attorney General are deeply concerned. And, and the reference to the Attorney General was deliberate because essentially it would be the Attorney General who under British law would decide whether the Guardian would be prosecuted under the Espionage Act. So this was a kind of posh threat, essentially, done in private uh, by David Cameron's emissary to us. And so we had a kind of dialogue with the government. Uh, and uh, Alan Rusbridger, the Guardian's editor-in-chief, said, well, Sir Jeremy, firstly, you know, we can assure you that we're not going to publish anything operational which might compromise intelligence, uh, intelligence activities abroad, but we will continue to do stories on mass surveillance. Um, and he also explained that Snowden had very cleverly distributed this material in different countries with different legal jurisdictions. So some of this material was with Glenn Greenwald in Rio de Janeiro. Some of this material was with Laura Poitras, who'd returned to Berlin. We had some, and uh, moreover, we'd also partnered with the New York Times, um, where there's a First Amendment, where there's constitutional protections, and so on. So it was scattered in different continents. Um, and so Jeremy was not in listening mode. Um, I mean, my kids do this thing where they go, la, 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 la. I don't know if your kids do that. But, but he was really kind of doing la, 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 la to us. Um, and he said, um, and I quote, he said, the prime minister cares about you, the Guardian, a lot more than about some American blogger. That was Glenn Greenwald, the most famous journalist on the planet. And then he added, and this is the killer, you should feel flattered the Prime Minister thinks you are important. <laughs> so that was the message from our Etonian Prime Minister. You should feel flattered the Prime Minister thinks you are important. Um, so we were, th this was a moment of kind of 
pretty high editorial anxiety for us and legal anxiety because uh, essentially what, what the government was saying in its kind of posh way was that um, we will use prior restraint. In other words, if you carry on publishing this stuff that we don't like, we will use the law against you, uh, we will get a gagging injunction, we will stop your reporting activity. Uh, and the, the calculation, the advice from our lawyers was that the government will probably be successful, that we could no longer report on Snowden or interrogate this material. Um, and we would be tied up in a very costly and expensive legal battle that could, could drag on for a, for, for a very long time. Um, and so after some deliberation, we decided that we would, um, in July of last year, that we would smash up our laptops in the Guardian building, um, but in a kind of symbolic way. In other words, we wouldn't give this material back to, uh, to investigators because it, it would help build a case against Edward Snowden but we would smash up our hard drives while making it perfectly clear we had the same material on different computers in New York, in the offices of the New York Times, and we would continue to report. Um, and during this kind of bizarre episode, I got the impression that David Cameron and his team didn't really understand the digital world, that they didn't really understand that if you smashed a computer and the material was elsewhere, the problem would not go away. Um, <laughs> and I don't know whether it was ineptitude, stupidity, a kind of political imperative to do something, one gets the impression that Cameron is someone who always wants to do something, but he's, he's never very strategic about what it is he has to do or needs to do. Um, I don't know. But <clears throat> this kind of culminated in uh, really the kind of the most surreal uh, scene drama of my kind of professional journalistic life. I mean, I, I've been all over the world reporting from various foreign countries, but actually the most ridiculous thing happened in our underground car park of The Guardian one Saturday morning last summer when... Um, Essentially, we, we, we agreed we would smash up our own computers, watched by two middle-aged spies, um, Ian and Chris, uh, from a, uh, government communication headquarters, GCHQ in, in, in provincial Cheltenham, who had come down to London. It appeared they'd been lurking in a white van round the back for a couple of weeks. Uh, and they essentially... Uh, advised us how to smash up a laptop. And it's, it's a lot harder than you might think. I mean, it's one thing spilling coffee on it, but, but destroying it irrevocably is quite a tough thing to do. And so they said, okay, guys, you'll need goggles, you'll need drills, dremels, all this kind of thing. And we said, okay, we'll buy those, we'll buy them. And they said, you'll need one of these. And the one of these was something that looked like a a small microwave oven, probably like the kind you have in your Nor Norwegian kitchens. Uh, but actually, it, it's called a degausser, a degausser, and it's used for demagnetizing hard drives. Um, we thought, okay, degausser, can't find it on eBay. Um, <laughs> we'll have to get one. And we said, okay, well, we'll get our own because we don't really trust you. And they said, no, you won't. And we said, yes, we will. And they said, no, you won't. It costs 30,000 pounds. And then we said, okay, we'll use yours. <laughs> so, 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 so we borrowed the degas and we bought the goggles. We went to the underground car park. We turned off the fire extinguishers. And this was three hours uh, of hot, sweaty work. of Kind of like this and um, smashing stuff up. And if, if, you, if the video had played, you would have seen it. It's actually quite dramatic. Um, and... In the end, this stuff was, was destroyed. And, and um, what was quite another farcical element was that Ian and Chris at one point were very worried because after the stuff had been kind of deconstructed into small chunks, we posted it into the degausser. And for about five minutes, nothing happened. And then Ian started taking photos with his iPhone and bent over. And finally, there was a kind of pop like that. And that was it. That was the end of the Snowden Files in the United Kingdom. Um, and... I think, I mean, there are a few conclusions to draw. What, one, I mean, I write about this in the book. I say that this episode was half pantomime and half Stasi, the East German secret police. And I think that's right. Um, uh, but it also just shows you the legal complexities of dealing with this kind of story. In the end, I think our, our, our solution was legally elegant. We, we didn't compromise on this material. We didn't hand it back. We did destroy it under, under duress, under threat of prior injunction. But we also made clear that we would continue to report and continue to, to investigate, which we did um, 
which I think was extremely important. <clears throat> now, th there are a few things I want to say to you. I I've never talked to so many lawyers in one room before, so um, I, have, I have a few points which I think are important that you should know. I mean, firstly, we have to ask ourselves, and you have to ask yourself as lawyers, what do we know thanks to Edward Snowden? Well, what we know is that the NSA, GCHQ, uh, routinely collect pretty much all global communications uh, by default. So they've essentially they've hacked the data cables which connect uh, Google um, and Yahoo. They have hacked the undersea cables which transmit internet and telephony data between the mainland United States and the United Kingdom. In fact, we do the hacking, the British do the hacking on the US's behalf, going to Norway. So all of your conversations are uh, hacked. And pretty much everything you do online is being collected. So texts, emails, web searches, um, the whole lot, it's all being collected. Now, what I'd quite like to do, if, unless we're suffering from another technical failure, is um, I want to do a little experiment, because I want to tell you about geolocation data. Now, some of you may know this, and some of you may not. I'm hoping you all have iPhones, and you all have them switched on. If you haven't, have you got an, how many people got iPhones? Oh, that's enough, right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so fine, so if you take your iPhone, let's go to the first slide. Uh, you, you see, in, in, in um, the English settings there, it's that gray icon which is circled called settings. By the way, if anyone's having an affair, maybe don't do this. <laughs> um, so you go to, uh, so you click on that, and you go down to, sorry, next slide. Uh, okay, yeah, privacy. In English, it's privacy, the gray icon with the white hand. So, and if, if, you, if you haven't got one, look over your neighbor's shoulder, I would say. Um, so if you get, click on privacy. Okay, and then you get, in English, it's location services. Uh, Norwegian, stedsjenester. Was that good? That was bad, wasn't it? Okay, all right. You can tell me later, complain later. <laughs> uh, so click on location services, that's Jonasta. Uh, are you still with me? Uh, okay, and it's, it's system services in English. Click on system services. Uh, and then you go to, uh, in English it's frequent locations, ofte bezukte stetter? Stetter, okay, I'm sorry. Um, everyone still with me? Yeah. Okay, we're nearly there. Okay, and what do you find? You find a list of everywhere you've been. Okay, and, and pick, a, pick an entry, any entry will do. And then you find a map. So, uh, exactly where you've been, when you've been, to the second, with a map, place by place, and it, it turns out that the iPhone, and we've seen the documents which, which prove this, the NSA asserts this, is the world's greatest spying device. It's a personal tracking device. I mean, just look at your data and tell me whether it's accurate. Uh, uh, and and ge generally, it's, it's absolutely accurate. So for example, I can see from my data that I was giving a TED talk in Athens on Sunday, um, and yeah, so, Sunday, 12.32, I'm in the Acropolis Museum <laughs> in Athens. Um, and there's a little button in English which says clear history. You can clear your history to get rid of this stuff. But it doesn't get rid of this stuff. It just gets rid of it on your iPhone. It's still being collected omnisciently. And so it means all of your data, um, everywhere you go, every two seconds, your little phone uh, sends a message to a cell tower, and that's what's being intercepted. So it's a perfect record of your movements. It's, it's absolutely... Astonishing. Um, did, did that work for everybody? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Anyone shocked or did you know this already? Mine Let, is off. Yours is switched off, but it's not really switched off. It just looks like it's switched off. No, it means you can't see it, but it means that, that it's still being collected. <laughs> so you can console yourself that it's not there, but it is there. <laughs> so so, so th this is quite shocking. I mean, um, and this isn't the only way the spy agencies kind of rig the system against you as a kind of digital uh, customer. I mean, another thing they do is uh, legislation. I mean, the, the legislation in Britain, which governs all this stuff, is massively out of date. It was, it was passed in 2000 when there was no Facebook, when there was no uh, 
I mean, Google had just started, but there was no Twitter, there was no YouTube. Uh, so, so it was passed in a kind of analog era, and yet it's regulating this era of big data um, uh, and, and digital platforms that we all use. Um, and British law is really, um, this isn't a technical legal phrase, but really cheaty, if you understand what I mean. In other words, for example, it classifies if you send a message on Facebook, that goes via a server in the United States, that's classified under British law as an external communication, which means that GCHQ is entitled to collect it without a warrant, <laughs> externally, because in theory it goes to America and back again. So we have all sorts of problems uh, thrown by the Snowden files to do with political oversight, um, to do with accountability, to do with transparency, but also above all, I think, to do with legislation and laws. Our laws are not fit for purpose. Uh, and I'd be interested, perhaps we can talk afterwards about Norwegian laws. Um, yeah, um, so, I mean, lastly, and this is the point I want to sort of take, I want you to take away from this talk if you can. What, what we've learned from Edward Snowden, I think, has absolutely profound implications for the legal profession, for, for what you do, for your relationship with clients, for privacy, for confidentiality, for the relationship between the legal profession and the Norwegian state. It's unbelievably important um, because essentially we've found from a case recently um, in the United Kingdom that GCHQ, the British spy agency, has been listening in on the privileged communications between lawyers and their clients. In, in the case of a, a Libyan uh, who was abducted by the CIA in 2004, uh, uh, sent, rendered, basically sent back to, to Tripoli, to Libya, uh, and then tortured by Muammar Gaddafi. Okay, and, and he then subsequently sued the British government, and his conversations with his lawyers were being eavesdropped. And this is the problem. Um, and so, you know, you really need to kind of think about this, that, that I'm going to read you two quotes from Edward Snowden. So Adam Rusbridger and Ewan McCaskill went to see um, Edward Snowden in Moscow this summer, uh, and we're talking for about seven and a half hours for about all sorts of things, but I think there are two quotes which are kind of relevant to you and to what you do. Uh, the first one is Edward Snowden. What last year's revelation showed us was irrefutable evidence that unencrypted communications on the internet are no longer safe and cannot be trusted. Their integrity has been compromised and we need new security protocols to protect them. That's what he said. So everything you do, not encrypted, is not safe. And basically, Rusbridger asked Snowden what sort of professional should try and start to change their behavior as a result of what we now know, thanks to Edward Snowden. And Snowden answered, we haven't published this, so I'm telling this, telling this for the first time. So Snowden's answer was, it's a constantly increasing list. I would say lawyers, doctors, investigators, possibly even accountants. Anyone who has an obligation to protect the privacy interests of their clients is facing a new and challenging world, and we need new professional training and new professional standards. This is Edward Snowden's message to you today, um, and I think it's a very important message. Now, I, um, I don't think we should be uh, paranoid. I think we should stay cheerful, um, but I think you as a kind of profession... Uh, as a collective, need to kind of take precautions. I mean, I don't know, does that, anyone remember the 1980s? Or are you all too young? You remember the 1980s? Okay, I mean, I, I think it, in a way, obviously we can't, we can't bail out from the electronic world, but uh, if you can go back to the, you remember pen and paper? Do you remember that? <laughs> okay, when you used to write stuff. Um, uh, that's kind of quite a useful world, but I mean, I would say if you are involved in a sensitive case uh, with a sensitive client, it doesn't have to be terrorism, I would suggest that as a matter of, of routine, uh, sort of default protocol, you take your mobile phone, which is what we as investigative journalists do, and you put it somewhere else. Um, you don't actually have that with you when you're, when you're chatting. I would also urge you to try and download basic encryption. It's very easy to do. You don't have to do it all the time. Um, uh, there's a program called PGP, which you can use. But for sensitive communications, I think you must encrypt. Um, come up with a, with a good, complicated passphrase. Maybe not Margaret Thatcher is 100% sexy. I don't know whether the Norwegian Prime Minister is 100% sexy, but, but <laughs> something like that. <laughs> the Norwegian Prime Minister is 100% sexy that your own spy agency will probably never guess. Um, and 
Snowden's advice was also, you know, put your phone in the fridge. The fridge is good. It's a sort of Faraday cage if you're, if you're a geek. Also, we found a cocktail shaker works. I don't know if you have cocktail shakers in Norway, but, but cocktail shaker is good. Um, so, so that's it. So I would say, politely, you know, wake up. <laughs> wake up. Wake up. Um, and try and bring these practices into your professional life. Uh, and just lastly, because I can see Katerina hovering there. Um, in a, you're, you're like a kind of bouncing rabbit when you do that, yeah. Um, lastly, I would say, I also think we all owe uh, a big debt of gratitude to Edward Snowden. He's done a tremendous thing. He um, faces a very uncertain life in exile in Moscow, um, I think with no prospect of return to the United States. He's been charged with espionage. Uh, and under the US Espionage Act, he, it's an absolute liability law. He cannot mount a public interest defense. And so I think he's stuck in Putin's Russia for a long time. But I think he's the guy who's kind of pulled back the curtain and showed us the, the real nature of things. Um, and I would thank him. Thank you. Mm -hmm.